doesn't appear that we have any so far. And uh, Heather, if you wouldn't mind um, posting the link to the survey now in the chat, that way uh, folks could have access to that um, throughout the presentation um, as well. And of course, you'll have access to it. She'll post it again at the end of the meeting so that you can have access to it um, uh, again, of course. Okay. All right, so if we're ready, Heather, um, if you wouldn't mind pressing record at this point in time, if you prefer your camera to be off, now would be the time to turn that camera off uh, as we will start our presentation. So you let me know when you're ready, Heather. Okay, I think we're good. I'm going to post it now in the chat. Okay, perfect. Okay, we're good. Noreen, you may be muted. I am muted. Thank you so much, John Galbraith. So again, uh, welcome everyone uh, to our virtual open house. Uh, thank you so much for attending this evening and uh, we hope to answer as many questions around the concepts we're going to be presenting this evening. Um, uh, Co-hosting this evening is Heather Marner from our district office, uh, who will be assisting with uh, a recording the session, as well as um, queuing any questions that might come up through the chat throughout the session. Please do feel free. This can be a back and forth presentation. If you have questions along the way, um, John and Heather uh, will help keep uh, an eye on those questions. Um, John Galbraith, our Director of Operations, is also with us this evening and driving the slide deck. And Carla Hogan, um, our Executive Director of Business Services, is also here this evening. And of course, Carla's expertise is finance and can help answer any of the questions around um, finance as we all can um, assist in answering those questions as well. So again, Thank you for being here and we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, you can see the agenda on the screen. So welcome, and we've done some introductions. Um, the purpose for um, these open house sessions is really to uh, present um, a, about a year's worth of work, well, more than a year's worth of work, uh, that our task force, uh, our facility, man facility master plan task force, put together around our um, uh, facilities, are specifically around our secondary facilities. And then uh, also we want to present what were some of the driving factors that after a lot of research uh, drove the task force work. And then what we're going to do is present really the meat and potatoes. And that is what are these concepts for our secondary facilities that perhaps you've already read about, or perhaps you've already attended one of our other sessions, but these concepts are just ideas that came from the driving principles after we did a lot of research and study as a task force. And so the what we really want feedback is on those concepts, things that uh, you think are good ideas, things that you think we need to rethink, things that you still have a lot of questions about. So. Uh, that is really important that you uh, surface your questions so that we can answer as best as we can. Um, we will be um, having a, um, an update on finances and where the buckets of money come from for us uh, building buildings and for upgrades of facilities in our district. And then um, just an update too on this is our last uh, community virtual um, input session. 
Um, but we also have um, some other sessions that we're doing with staff and some community leaders. And then this, of course, will continue to be accessible um, virtually, the recorded sessions virtually on our website. But also what we might find is that um, questions still need to be answered and we might need to host another virtual session or even smaller open houses uh, throughout our district. Ultimately, we hope to bring all the feedback that we get around these concepts to the board for a work session in October and that they will have an opportunity to review all your input. Um, they've already been presented these ideas at a board meeting and that they too can um, consider and reconsider the concepts that have been presented. Ultimately, we just wanna synthesize the purpose of the work with our vision and making sure that, again, we're gathering your thoughts and input. So thanks again for being here tonight. Greatly appreciate it. So big picture, this is the purpose and the vision of this very exciting work. Uh, as you all may already know, our vision as a district is every learner future ready. And what we mean by every learner is each and every single child every single person having access to a high quality education to get what they need for their next steps, which is the future ready part of this. So that means kindergartners are ready for first grade, all the way through our system are graduates with their post-secondary plans. And so a facility certainly has a role to play when we think about that vision uh, around equity, access, and our kids getting exactly what they need and when they need it to be successful. Secondly, um, just so that you understand, this is an ongoing conversation. We are constantly assessing our facilities, our enrollment and population, which is why uh, the board adopted in 2018, a big picture facility master plan and that ended up focusing specifically on the elementary schools and our scope of uh, concept, which was to reduce the number of elementary schools we had because of the unevenness we had around our district, elementary schools from populations of say 230, all the way to elementary schools that were upwards towards 600. And when you look at equity and distribution of resources, especially human resources, that gets to be very, very challenging. Also from best practices and what we know about best practice educational research is the more collaborative environment you can create, um, the better. And so in our smallest schools, we may have only one second grade teacher teaching um, that particular grade level in an elementary school, which makes it really challenging then to collaborate. Doesn't give a whole lot of options for students and parents also in that school um, in regards to um, uh, options for that grade level and, and the homeroom teacher. So the concept is, the reason why we've looked at this uh, concept of going from 21 elementaries to 13-ish, 12 to 13, is um, that we could have better access to equity, to resources, and that um, we can have better opportunity for our students for really future ready facilities, um, giving them the best possible uh, environments for future ready learning. And that also addresses staff needs as well. And then finally, we will continue to assess the needs of our students, our district and our community, and of course the economic development. When the plan was adopted in 2018, what was not included was a plan for the secondary system, but the task force knew at that time and the board did as well, that that conversation would have to resurface. And here we are, is it four or five years later, we're gonna have to think about secondary. And here we are four or five years later considering secondary facilities. So um, that is the big picture of the work. So this was our task force when uh, it was regenerated in the fall last year. Uh, we needed to enlist the help of a facilitator who could help us assess the physical environments of our secondary facilities, 
as well as the educational needs of our facilities. So we did an RFP process and OPN was um, the architect who, architectural firm who um, uh, uh, participated in that RFP process. They were the only participate participant in that RFP process. And we were very fortunate that they, they were willing to say yes and do this very, very heavy lift for our district. To assess 10 secondary school settings is a huge job. So ultimately the task force had to not only look at data of enrollment and population, but they also had to look data at data around um, the current condition of facilities. So that took several months of unpacking all of that information. And so um, there was, uh, in addition to touring facilities and assessing the data on paper, uh, listening sessions were conducted in our buildings with staff members and with students just to hear about what their experiences are with facilities and what their needs are with facilities. Um, you can see the gold row there around the task force. That was some of the activities that the task force did to research and unpack all the information around the current state of our secondary facilities. And then we started with the, now the community. Once we put all the information together, we had to get to a place where we said, okay, we have this information. Now, what would be a best step put forward um, that centered on some principles and some concepts that we can then share with the community? So that's where we are now is getting feedback from the community. And then we will continue um, to assess uh, that feedback. So if you go to the next slide, please, John. Through the analysis and the discussion with the task force, these ended up being the big picture concepts that the task force used in order to um, uh, zero in on the best recommendations to move forward on some ideas. So sustainability, enrollment, the geographic location of schools, a um, big picture of the master plan, and not just for this decade, but for, and probably not just 20 to 30 decades, but what we believe will happen with this particular concept is it will serve our district for probably 50 to 60 years uh, in regards to feeder systems and um, enrollment trends and condition of facilities. So on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see everything that the task force considered when looking at the data. So it was not just middle school renovations and projects, it was also high school renovations. We even talked about what would it look like to have two high schools, one in the north and one in the south side. And um, that did not end up being a concept that we um, found through the data would be um, um, a best concept to move forward, but we really explored and kept our minds open to all possibilities. And, uh, and what could make a difference both uh, for the educational environment, but also financially, and then how to continue to provide the best access and equity for all students and families. So we thought about new construction projects, major renovations, and of course, also upgrades. And so you'll see a little bit of all of that in the concepts that will be recommended. So where the task force landed was on some of these driving factors. You go to the next slide, please, John. Perfect. Um, currently, we decided as a task force that the best recommendation for our current high school structure is to keep it as is. And that is three comprehensive high schools with one alternative high school. Also acknowledging that we have a, a breadth of enrollment figures in the high schools. So Kennedy is our largest pushing um, well above 1,800 um, students, sometimes into the 1,900 zone, um, and depending on um, uh, the uh, enrollment uh, for that particular year, but that's about where we've been trending, versus Washington High School that's had some declining enrollment, uh, which it lands somewhere between 14 and 1,500. And so that is a big difference. So when you think about resources and distribution within our system, uh, we one of the concepts that became important 
to the um, task force was not just maintaining those high school structures, but also working towards evening the enrollment for the high schools as well throughout our district. Second concept that became a driving factor, we're reducing the number of middle schools in our district. And then simultaneously considering a direct feeder system to our high schools. For example, right now, we only have two middle schools that are direct feeders to high schools. All of Wilson students currently go to Jefferson High School, or at least that's the direct feeder. Families sometimes choose other options, but that, that's the direct feeder. And McKinley is also a direct feeder to Washington High School. Kennedy does not have one single middle school that is a direct feeder. All of the middle schools that, that go to Kennedy also go to one of the two other high schools and split. So that becomes a challenge uh, for certainly our eighth grade families and students about which high school am I going to? Well, you have two options and some go to Jefferson and some go to Kennedy or some go to Kennedy and some go to Wash. And so that is um, something that we would like that would enhance and support our programming and predictability for our students and families, as well as um, uh, certainly for not just curricular um, support, but extracurricular support as well, when we think about activities and athletics. Thirdly, equitable facilities across the district, I've already addressed that, but making sure that we have um, the same amount of resources in every building, um, and kinds of resources that students need to be successful. And then uh, the fourth bullet, there's a lot of discussion around this and that a district aquatic center. At each one of the pools in our high schools currently need um, renovation. And if we were to address each one of those high schools, just upgrading the pool by itself would be oh, somewhere in the $7 million range um, maybe a little above that, maybe a little below that, depending on each of the high school's needs. And that addresses the pools only. That doesn't necessarily make the pools bigger, more lanes, just a, um, a, an upgrade of the pool. Uh, it, but it doesn't change also the, the audience and spectator experience at all. It would just address the pool. And the high school also has other needs for multi-purpose spaces and um, could always use a more academic space. So we were looking at all the concepts and thought about, well, we already do a lot of shared work, for example, with Kingston. Could that potentially be a concept to consider for our swimming programs? And uh, the more we talked to the athletic directors and got feedback, this became a real conversation for the task force. And we said, you know what, for, um, a uh, 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 less amount of money and for a visionary approach and addressing um, the uh, not just upgrading pools, but have uh, the best competition pool possible, a practice pool and a diving well, all in one location would actually be better for our current programs than just one pool um, at each of the high schools in regards to managing um, the amount of students who are out for swimming. It, it gets complicated with scheduling for those multiple teams, but it is very doable because we're already doing that with other programs. And what that would also do is allow for the space in the high schools, current pool space to be repurposed. And we'll talk more about that in a little, little bit, but um, that's what was the deep consideration for a centralized district aquatic center. And then finally, uh, we recognize that all the middle schools and high schools need improvement. And so um, all the buildings need attention. So here is the concepts and we're gonna start with the middle schools. So again, these concepts were taken from those driving factors and all of the data that we were using about what, what would be possible. So the first concept uh, on this idea, on these ideas for this task force, um, were, was uh, to first build a new middle school, brand new, on the north side of our district, 
probably in the Hiawatha area. We have growth in our district in Hiawatha, in the Palo area, and out in the west side near Highway 100 and the Stony Point area. Because of that growth, especially on the north side, we see an increased potential population up on the north side. And therefore, we know that we're gonna to need to consider that population in our buildings already. But what this would provide is a new 1200 student size building. And if you've ever been in a larger middle school like that, um, they're built in kind of pods or families. And you have like a sixth grade pod and family, a seventh grade pod and family, an eighth grade pod and family. So it almost feels like three miniature sized schools in one larger building with all the amenities of athletic fields, et cetera, on the outside. And that school would be the direct feeder and the only direct feeder to Kennedy High School. Secondly, what was a consideration was the south side of town. And um, could Wilson, due to its, um, the, the land um, that Wilson has, has a really good topography to consider different concepts doesn't have a whole lot of hills on it. Um, it has some nice size land property that's all our ownership and could potentially Wilson be a consideration for not a west side feed, but really a south side feed. And that Wilson would be re-boundaried and it would become a feeder to Washington High School. And we would consider a renovation of that historical building which could also then, um, because of, again, the topography of the land, we could have a nice new addition to that building. Um, it, that, that property could also um, encompass a new building, but that would be um, something that we think that we would need a lot more community input around if we considered a new build. But we do think it would be very interesting uh, for a renovation and an addition. There would be 600 students at that particular site. And uh, that again would be that become a direct feeder to Washington High School. So it would be more of a south side feed um, than um, a west side feed. And that means that probably, probably the um, um, boundary for Wilson in regards to enrollment would come over a couple blocks. Currently our east side, west side is divided by the river downtown we would probably hop the, over the river just a little bit, more over into the Checktown area. Everything downtown in Nubo area is all Washington High School. We would just stretch over the river a little bit. And so it would be more like an interstate cutoff instead of the river cutoff in regards to um, enrollment for Washington High School. That would also address our enrollment needs um, across the system as well. And by the way, this would all need reboundering of our um, all of our secondary schools. Next would be Franklin. We would also consider a renovation there. Uh, we've done some recent upgrades to Franklin, including new windows this past summer. Over two million dollars were the windows at Franklin, and it is is our largest historic building, I believe, by square footage, and just has a lot of opportunity because it too has a nice sized land and an additional property that's also. Um, for athletic purposes right now. That too would be a 600 student building and would also be a direct feeder to Washington High School. And then lastly would be a renovation at Taft. This would be a two-step process. We would start with um, kind of the first interim step would be a renovation on especially the large areas like the, a new gym and um, uh, common use spaces. And that would be a certain and upgrades that are needed for the building um, within those two major renovations. The second step process would be down the road, uh, probably a second ask actually to the community for a complete new build. So the two renovations would actually be projected as new parts of a new building. And that new building would come later. As much as we'd love to do all this in one fell swoop, we also know what we can afford. And um, this would be the first step would be what we could afford. Therefore, Roosevelt would remain open. 
um, and Roosevelt and Taft would then be defeaters to Jefferson until we did the second step. And then we would repurpose Roosevelt. Also, what we would do is repurpose McKinley under this middle school concept. And McKinley is, is our sweet gem. It is um, downtown right there in the MedCore, a lot of historic connection to McKinley. Uh, but as we increase our innovative projects and our, for example, you may have seen recently all of our announcements around our high school magnet program, we see that McKinley could stay in our inventory and perhaps be repurposed for one of those innovative programs as an innovative high school program, specifically the magnet school program. And so uh, it would still maintain as a Cedar Rapids school, but it would be considered for a smaller high school for that innovative program. So after that concept, I see now there's several questions in uh, the chat. And so John, if you wanna help me with these, that would be great. Um, yes, um, Mr. Owenklowski, the high school attendance areas would change, which then would also impact middle school, which then would ultimately impact um, the uh, elementaries as well. And that will be the way in which we're addressing enrollment um, as well for a longer term concept to really balance out enrollment, looking at more like 1600 students in each of our high schools. That is Jefferson's size right now. However, they've had increased this year of almost 100 students. Um, and so as uh, Kennedy's had a little bump as well, WASH has not. So we would reboundary um, the high schools. Great question. Those boundaries would change as the, um, as the master plan is put underway. So we would, the, the, the uh, soonest in which we would open that new middle school, which would actually be the first step in this process, um, would be uh, fall of 26, isn't that correct, John? Yeah, that's correct. 26 at the very earliest or potentially 27. So we're three or four years out from a new building opening. Yeah, and so what? in order to renovate buildings, you have to have a place for the kids to go. So what might happen is that new building opens, but it may not be completely full the first year until um, uh, some more renovations are done. So then we could unravel the um, uh, boundaries as best as we could on a very clear timeline. But we haven't worked out and ironed out all the nuts and bolts to that yet, as we just need to know that these concepts would be um, doable. And as we get feedback from the community that we would uh, wanna make sure that we're also getting that kind of input too about uh, reboundering. So after we have our board work session in October, we'll continue to get some feedback. And then part of the next um, unveiling, I guess you could say, of what potentially could go to a ballot for voting in March would also need to include at least conceptually where we would consider some of those boundaries. It probably will not have at this specific point in time street names, but it would have at least an idea of where we think uh, the boundaries would be by concept for the three high schools as best as we can. But we also know things change quickly as we were impacted by the derecho. Hopefully nothing like that happens again to our district, but we know that enrollment can change. And so we need to constantly assess that enrollment, but we would wanna make sure that we've got the best information possible so that when we open in 26 or 27, that would be the soonest in which we would implement new boundaries. Um, so the question is around supporting students and behavioral needs. So I'm gonna come back to the educational concepts that honestly, if you, you have more people collaborating around the work, um, there are better services and programs that we can provide. Conceptually, if you reduce the inventory that you have, that we have from six buildings in the middle school, for example, to four buildings, but we maintained our staff number, at least initially as needed, we would be able to better staff our buildings. 
Right now we have uneven enrollment in our middle schools as well. I um, mean, it's a bigger discrepancy than um, our high schools. So we have one middle school that's uh, maybe just below 400. And then uh, Harding is way over 700 this year. And so when you have that kind of um, discrepancy or, or unevenness in enrollment, then you got to steal staff from one area in order to provide it to the another area because we're not getting more money for staff. And we'll talk about buckets of finance, but the buckets that help facilities aren't the same buckets that fund staff. And so that would be how we could better assist. But also we're implementing a lot of things to assist with those, um, those kinds of supports for behavior as well. So we would probably staff differently too. Great, the question about the middle school boundaries, that would be simultaneous when we would, uh, around that 26, 27 uh, school year, when we would open the first middle school. So we'll get to the high school next. That's a great question. We'll be there next. Thank you for that. So yes, the birth rates have dropped. Um, however, we used um, a population specialist um, who um, analyzed the data and brought that to the task force. So we were able to now look at current population and um, um, uh, past population, but also projected future population enrollment. And so uh, it looks to um, level out a little bit as the projections uh, for our community look um, in the next 10 years. But also when you have evenness, fewer buildings and, and uh, even enrollment around, or at least attempted to even enrollment, it's better to manage those birth rates um, as a district across the system. So yes, we did uh, look at birth rate data as well. No, that's a great question about the Magnet High School. Magnet High School would not be located next year at McKinley, that would be down the road. Uh, initially, we're hoping to get about 200 students in that uh, magnet high school option, but we understand it'll be a new concept. So it'll probably be somewhere between 100 and 200 students. We will have a different location um, downtown. Um, if you're familiar with the Iowa Big Program, that is a program of ours. That is also a high school program, really addressing juniors and seniors, doing community projects, working on uh, project-based learning with partners from businesses and nonprofits in our community. And um, we actually rent space out of New Boco area, the geometric building. So we would have initially other space um, that's going to be downtown more than likely, and that hopefully will be announced soon that we would use initially for the placement of that high school. Down the road, hopefully as the population might increase for that virtual high school and the Magnet High School, um, or sorry, the Magnet High School, we would hopefully land at our beautiful McKinley. So what would be done with the closed building? So I just talked about McKinley, but also uh, to think about um, Harding, for example, would be a building that we would repurpose. Uh, and uh, as the new building to the north would be built in Hiawatha, Harding would be a building that we would need for probably a while because we would, if we're renovating Franklin, we can't have kids in the building during renovation. So we would be using initially some of those empty buildings to serve our kids as we get the projects underway. But after that, I think there would be definitely some interest from members of our community and that specific property because it's adjacent to Knoll Ridge Park. It has multiple gym access. It has a cafeteria. It has an auditorium, sounds like a great community center to me. And so we will be working with um, our community on repurposing what Harding might become several years down the road when the new building would open. Um, let me see what else I'm missing. Yes, well, what we've had at Harding is honestly, um, there were some added classrooms John, one of, those, one of those classrooms added at Harding, that was a while ago, but if you wanna address the Harding um, question about growth. Yeah, um, so there were some 
there was an addition put on to Harding. I don't have those numbers in front of me 30 years ago, 40 years ago, somewhere in that time frame. And really it's not usable space because of the layout. Um, you have to walk through classrooms to get to, to, get to other classrooms. Um, and obviously that doesn't work well um, in a school setting. Um, but to relate to your question here is on, is there an addition that can be put on? So we did some assessment on that and I see that uh, Joe Tercy from OPN and Vicki are on, so you guys feel free to chime in here too. Um, but we did some assessment there and the lay of the land and the amount of land that's there, it doesn't really lend itself well to an addition um, and be able to get the spaces and places that we need um, in those type of middle schools. So I would say this, if we were to continue to have enrollment increase to Harding, if we don't, have a different plan, we're going to have to look at reboundering that area again because of that growth because we will not have more space. So th that's a good point because with this particular concept of, of this middle school idea, hopefully what that would do is address long-term needs. And as, our, um, as new developments happen up north and to the west and who knows where else they might pop up, we would better be able to accommodate that with um, this plan than um, waiting, wondering, and then, oh, we got a reboundary every 10 years. Uh, we'd rather have a, um, something that's sustainable, which of course is that first concept that drove a lot of our task force work. Um, next question was, will imminent domain be used? Um, we haven't had to at this point in time uh, for our elementary projects that have been underway. We did um, do some collaborative work with a property owner um, at the um, Maple Grove site. Um, and uh, we didn't have to use eminent domain. They were actually um, interested in uh, a collaboration with the district. So we did purchase a private property there so that the other great entity has been so flexible working with us is the city. And both for the West Willow Elementary Project and the Maple Grove Project, we have done land swaps with them. And so what was city property is now uh, school district property. And what was school district property is now city property, especially when we're right next to parks like there at, um, it was formerly the Jackson site. And so, um, but we don't know that yet if eminent domain will be necessary. Our hope is that it wouldn't be and that we can find a way to um, work with our community and um, projects that we try to do that through these concepts that we can use our current properties to accomplish this and wouldn't need to use eminent domain. And when will we decide if Wilson will be demolished? Um, so as you can see what's projected tonight, the first thing we have is a renovation and addition. And if that is, seems to get the best support, then we would like to explore that, that project that way. However, if we get deep into it, we're saying, oh, we, with this, this might not be able to accommodate 600 kids total, although we believe it would, then we would have to consider perhaps a new build. But if that was a consideration, you can see the parentheses on the side here of the, uh, uh, next to Wilson is, we would have a subgroup to guide that study. But I, I think it would be a really um, interesting project to consider a renovation and addition first so that we would not have to demolish that historic building. Yes, we'll get to the, Butch, we will get to your question about um, taxes um, when we get to the finance part of the presentation. You bet. Um, Mr. Winklowski, I don't know if I can actually answer that question about the lack of real estate. Um, uh, at this point in time, but uh, we'll consider that for a future FAQ or um, John, maybe you wanna think about that uh, when we get towards the end of the presentation, but thanks for that question. We'll um, take that into consideration. We're not re real estate developers, so I, but we do work closely with realtors and um, the city and the city engineers. So, and we try to stay informed about um, new developments constantly and that too, was part of the data considered when we looked at these concepts. So let's move on to the high school concepts. So as mentioned earlier, we considered the new district aquatic center and I won't go into any more details, 
about um, uh, kind of what led to that decision. But I, just to reiterate, it would be um, not in a destination that's been determined, but hopefully a centralized destination or central enough and accessible for all three high schools as well as middle school teams. Um, it would um, include, uh, in order to do this successfully, we would want there to be a, co a competition pool, a practice pool, and a diving well. And as long as those three water entities would be in that facility, we would be able to manage um, the amount of teams and the schedule needed to accommodate everyone. Um, I am just amazed by our athletic directors and how much they manage on a scheduling basis every single day, but they've already worked through what sample schedules could look like. And they have a lot of experience this because we already um, uh, do this in our district, specifically with Kingston and some other programs. Um, secondly, what that would do is it would free up the multi, uh, the um, space in the, that's currently the pool space in the high schools. And John, will you talk a little bit more about that opportunity in the high schools and the multi-purpose spaces and what it might be able to do in the high schools? Yeah, I can do that. Um, so the current pool spaces, obviously pools now, um, there's a need at the high schools for some multi-purpose space, um, whether that's for extra classroom spaces, um, for student gathering spaces, um, either during school or um, for after school or before school events. Um, what we refer to as our non-revenue sports, so our dance teams, our cheerleading teams, so on and so forth. Um, currently, a lot of times you'll see them practicing in the cafeteria or um, potentially in a hallway because the gyms are full with volleyball games or basketball games. And um, that's not downplaying those sports at all. It's just I can't put a volleyball net or a basketball hoop in a cafeteria or a hallway, um, but it's still spaces that the um, cheerleading teams, dance teams, so on and so forth can use. So being able to get them some space that's um, dedicated for um, their activities to be able to use and then to also be able to use those spaces for um, lifetime wellness, um, yoga, speed training, things like that, um, that our, our buildings currently don't have. Um, as we look at those types of spaces that we don't have, um, it's a lot cheaper to renovate this pool area to put those spaces in um, than it would be to put an addition on um, for those spaces and then renovate the current pools um, to a new updated pool. So we really looked at the finances involved and how can we get um, a, the pool space up to the um, condition that we need those to be in and how do we get these other spaces that our buildings are lacking and what's the most economical way to do that. And um, looking at the finances on that, it, it was really became pretty clear that to renovate these the existing pool spaces to the multi-purpose spaces and then build a, an aquatic center is what made sense from the finance lens. Uh, the other piece about this, thank you, John, so much, is about the new aquatic center itself. What we're not able to do right now is host large swim events. Um, we can host a meet, um, like a dual meet, um, but uh, um, we don't have enough space to accommodate large crowds. And this would give us opportunity, um, even from an economic development point of view as a community, to host large swimming events. And uh, we've lost, we lost the, um, uh, the state volleyball um, tournament that used to be hosted in our town. And um, we would like to be considered uh, for, and we're the second largest district in the state. And if we can have high quality access and um, think about bringing people to our town um, and thinking about this also from a community point of view, not just our schools, but how could this aquatic center help our community as well from a bigger picture. So that too was, a, was an important factor that we discussed. Um, secondly, the second bullet here, um, that renovation area that John just unpacked is really that first bullet, is that multi-purpose area that we just lack so much of that opportunity in our high schools. If you have visited other neighboring 4A large high schools, uh, you can see the amount of space and access that their students have to um, um, extracurricular, co-curricular, whether that be athletic, um, speech, theater, drama, music, um, uh, all comprehensive programming, as well as 
co-curricular work, like John just said, our health and fitness programs and other programs that happen within the day. This could also include specific kind of classrooms that could have simulators and other things to um, support our kids in a big picture way. And so we just want to give all opportunity to our kids. They deserve it as much as possible. Um, the other, the second bullet is um, new turf practice fields. Um, that, that is really a needed um, practice opportunity in, in all of our schools. For example, right now, marching band uh, has to compete with football, and that is all levels of football um, for practice time on a field. And uh, we only have one turf in the entire district, and that's Kingston. And if you have a rainy fall um, or even just a week that's brought on a lot of cold and wetness, um, it, that those fields get done in pretty quickly. And our kids do not get the practice time that they need. And also managing multiple programs that use uh, the, that practice football field, including soccer and other programs year round. Um, the, the turf is, um, uh, th there's an easier upkeep. A uh, rain doesn't deter us from continued practice. Um, and now it becomes a mud pie out there and um, a safety concern um, at times, uh, especially if it's been a long duration of a soggy season. And so um, this also provides equity when you consider again, who our kids are competing with across the entire state. If they don't only get a couple of practices on turf or on a field before they head into a competition, um, that's really not setting them up for success. And we want to be able to do that as much as possible. We believe that academics um, are a driving factor in all of these decisions, but part of a student's whole life is athletics, activities, and our co-curricular programs, especially music and fine arts. So the more we can support the whole child, the better we are for our entire district. Um, Kennedy has needed a cafeteria upgrade. Uh, several years ago, Wash and Jefferson got upgrades when they had HVAC systems upgraded. And um, this would allow us to not just upgrade Kennedy's cafeteria and renovation um, uh, and, and the kitchen, but it will allow us to um, expand space a little bit there too, which is needed uh, for Kennedy, even in the current state of enrollment, it, it's needed. And then uh, finally, Metro um, was formerly an elementary decades and decades ago, but Metro has been accommodated as an alternative high school. It has fit the needs beautifully, except in, um, the, uh, in the gym space. It is still an elementary gym, and we do not have elementary sized children at Metro. And so uh, for their gym and uh, uh, fitness support, we, they're really asking for a new gym expansion, bigger, as well as locker rooms that are needed. Uh, their elementary schools are not built with locker rooms. And so um, that's uh, part of the consideration there too. Metro's also recently wrote for a couple of grants with their STEAM program. And so they've already designated some facility upgrades with some of those grants, but those, those were their two major priorities as we worked with the staff and students and also did our facility assessment. Okay, could you go, thank you, John. So big picture wise, this gives you, it's, I realize it may be a little hard to see, um, but it gives you um, an idea of our current site locations and what the feeder sites would be. Uh, John, would you mind walking through uh, this map and ultimately focusing on where kids would land for their high schools if we look at the um, um, uh, site locations for middle schools as well? Yeah, um, so as we look at the feeder system on uh, which middle schools would feed to which high schools, uh, we would have a new building um, on the north side of our district, um, somewhere up in the north part of Cedar Rapids, Hiawatha, Robbins area, um, that that would feed directly to Kennedy and that would be the only feeder to Kennedy. That would be a, a 1200 student building. Um, as we look at the feeders for Washington, that would be a renovated Franklin building um, that would house 600 students, would feed to Washington. And then at Wilson, 
um, we would either have an existing, excuse me, um, a renovated building with an addition or a new building at the Wilson site that would then feed to Washington as well. Uh, Noreen touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, the long range plan would that Taft would be the only feeder to Jefferson, um, but in the interim, it would be Taft and Roosevelt would both feed to Jefferson. Thanks, John. And so if we look at the next slide, um, this gets to the cost questions. And so ultimately, um, this is not down in the dirty details. This is the big concept. Uh, and um, thanks so much to OPN and their team and our other um, partners with all the data information in order to give a best estimate of what these concepts would cost. Um, so um, just to give you, um, a, you know, an estimate of what this would be. So the estimated construction cost would be 260, um, $1,338,759. But then we took a look at total project cost, and that includes um, permits, design fees, city requirements, all that stuff. And then also um, FFE is like the furniture and other things that need to go with um, renovations and new facilities. The projected total cost is 312 million. $406,511. Now that is a big price tag. Uh, just to give you a comparison, the new high schools that are being built right now in central Iowa, their price tags have been uh, about 135 million. So one high school, new high school costs 135 million. Um, this would be 312 to um, upgrade and support um, outcomes for um, what would be four future middle schools and all four high schools. It would also allow us some support um, initially out of the gate there, of course, for um, uh, Roosevelt to get some supporters what they need as well to sustain for a little while until we could get step two of uh, the Taft concept. Thank you, John. So what does that look like? Um, through buckets of money. And uh, Carla, you're on the call, correct? Yes, there she is. So uh, Carla, I'm gonna give some high level things, but then if you wanna unpack a little more, I think especially the next slide would be great. So these are, the, these are just some of the buckets of money, believe it or not, there are more buckets of money. Um, hats off to Carla and our finance team. School finance is super complex, but just so that you know, we have funds that can only pay for certain things and it's against the rules for those buckets to pay for other things. And so, for example, when we look at personnel and hiring teachers and hiring our custodians and our secretaries and everybody who works for the district, that comes out of the general fund bucket. And uh, I'd say it's about 90%, right, Carla, of our general fund goes towards people. Yes. Yeah. And so that's the biggest chunk that comes out of, out of, um, um, of that particular bucket. The buckets that pay for uh, facilities cannot pay for people. And so um, one of those is our... Um, um, our Pebble Fund. And so that is, again, comes from property tax, but this is used, basically it's the bucket that we use right now for facility upgrades. So uh, John Galbraith oversees um, as the director of operations, also the buildings and grounds team. And so this is when our buildings and grounds team is um, renovating um, an entryway or putting in new bathrooms. Those can be projected out of uh, the Pebble Fund and support that particular um, way of upgrading the long-term upgrades of our facilities. The other is what we call our SAVE fund. Um, this is what is currently funding our elementary projects. And so that is the bucket that we were able to use to fund our elementary facility master plan projects. So it's every couple of years, we've now done two buildings. We're starting to work on the third. Um, it's cost us about 20 million 
per project, but that's every couple of years that we're doing one of those projects. And we've targeted that particular bucket to pay for our elementary schools. That is already a funded bucket. Therefore, we didn't have to ask our community and our taxpayers to vote on anything because those funds already existed. We just prioritize them for this particular, uh, for the facility master plan work for the elementary schools. It also can pay for some other things in our district as well, but it too cannot pay for people. And then the last bucket that focuses on facilities is our debt service fund. And that would be what we call a bond issue. And so that is when we have to bring um, language and ideas to our voting community and our taxpayers to say, um, here's what we're asking for and here's what it would pay for. And then that uh, the taxpayers are the ones who vote whether that bucket will be used or not. Right now we are debt free. We do not have bond debt. Um, the last bond that we had was for Viola Gibson Elementary. And we just recently paid that off in the last uh, year. And so um, those are the three buckets of finance money. So if you go to the next screen, Carla, I'm gonna have you dig in a little bit deeper and talk about um, this particular ask and what that would do for the estimated tax rate increase. Okay, um, as you know, you all on your property in, uh, that you own, you get uh, a uh, property tax bill every year from uh, Lynn County. And with that, just a minute, with that, um, there's an assessed value. All uh, property has an assessed value and uh, there, is what's considered a rollback. And the rollback with uh, property is actually set by the state. And so every year the state decides what the rollback figure will be. And that's based on property valuations across the whole state. And they make sure that uh, property tax values don't go up too much in the state. Uh, and so they control that level. And so uh, the property tax rollback right now is a little over 50%. So if you have a house that's valued at $100,000 with the rollback, it ends up to be about $50,000 of assessed value. And that's what you're actually taxed on. And so with our bonding, um, we are uh, able to go to $2.70 per thousand dollars of assessed valuation. So you'll want to take your assessed value of your house times the rollback and um, then times two dollars and seventy cents. That's the maximum that we would go to on this this bond uh, vote uh, to figure out what it would be on uh, your property. And so the table that we show shows various levels of what the property would cost in taxes. So as you can see, if you have a $250,000 um, assessed value property times the rollback, your um, uh, additional tax would be $352.28 annually, which works out to be uh, $29.36 per month. And that would be for an estimated um, probably about 24 years, correct, Carla and John? Yeah, it would be somewhere in that time frame. Um, so we would issue bonds multiple times throughout this process um, for when we need the money. We have a set amount of time that we have to use the money um, when we issue the bonds. So we would issue that um, several times through this process. So depending on how that exactly works out, we're estimating it would be a 24 or 25 year time frame um, that, that we would have bond debt. Thank you. And so, we and then, oh, go ahead, Carla. And then the other thing that I just wanted to point out is as property tax valuations go up um, and based on the timing of the bonds, towards the end of those bonds, 
we can um, either reduce the levy amount or pay those bonds off early. So the higher the valuations go, the better it is for the district in uh, paying back the bonds. Thanks, Carla. And that would be our priority is uh, to do this, to of course pay back as, as quickly as we could, especially for our taxpayers. So if we go to the next slide. Hey, Noreen, we do have a couple more questions in the chat. Oh, okay, come on over. All right. Oh, okay, um, idea about boundaries for the renovated Wilson. So I would say if the, let's just concept wise, if the boundary for the um, renovated Wilson uh, being a south side feed then to Washington High School, if it were to like Wilson would be the bound would be the end there of that of that feeder, um, so but address wise, so I'd say it's probably right there, everything east then of 380 in that downtown area would more than likely feed to Wash, and then everything on the other side of 380 would more likely feed to Jefferson. So then when you think about the elementary schools and the middle schools on the east and the west side of that, um, that means um, uh, more likely than anything that's west of 380 would then become a feeder to uh, Taft and or Roosevelt initially. Great question about that. And we haven't figured out the details of which elementary would go where, but that would be the concept is those would still be west side feeds. But yes, Van Buren would probably more than likely not be a Wilson feeder school. And then um, HVAC. Oh, sure. Why don't we um, address that um, about the energy efficiency? Let's save that a little bit here for um, the end of the presentation, John. Um, we can talk a little bit about what we've done initially and what we what the future goals are. We can talk about that. We can also talk about there's a really great uh, board presentation around sustainability that we had just a, a, a couple months ago that would be really good um, reference for that question. So we'll come back to that. Thank you for that, Martin. So sticking to the budget question uh, right now, um, uh, Carla addressed the rollback situation. And so you can see the gold line here that said uh, rollback, but there's two columns here. One is for this fiscal year, FY 22-23, and the, uh, or, or sorry, and one is for last year's 21-22 school year. Um, we had an opportunity last year uh, because, and I won't go into the details of what budget guarantee means. Again, school finance is very complicated, but because our levy was impacted by not having to be on a budget guarantee last year with the state, we were able to save our taxpayers um, 60 cents um, on that um, uh, 60 cents on that uh, uh, levy. So we went from what was 1536 FY levy. Um, if you look at the uh, uh, second to last row here, um, the, um, the school levy was $15.36 per $200,000 residential home it was able to be reduced to 1471. And so because of that reduction of 1471, that was 60 cents, may not seem like a lot, but 60 cents we were able to put back in the taxpayers' uh, pockets. So that's great for this particular school year. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, this is the comparisons. So currently um, we're at 1471 for, for a property tax levy rate, but you can see our trend over time in fiscal year 2014, we we're at 1548, and then now we're at 1471. So we've tried to, as a district, pay, pay really good attention and, and take care of our taxpayers. However, we also know that there's been, um, we haven't had too many asks and certainly, um, that, therefore we, we know we need an ask in order to do what we'd like to do and what's needed in our secondary facilities. So this gives you comparisons to other districts around us. If we look at last year's uh, tax levy for our district, that yellow arrow shows you is at 1536. This year it is at 1473. Oh, I think I missed, that was a typo on the previous slide that should have been 1473 instead of 1471, apologize for that. But it's 1473. 
So if you look comparatively across the bar graph, you can see that um, who we compare to and what that um, looks like with our districts that surround us. So under the 1473, the only districts that are below that is one, and that's North Lynn. And so everybody else has a higher tax levy rate. And even if we were to bring on um, that $2.70 to 1473, we would still be lower than Center Point Urbana, Central City, College Commu Community is not, I don't have their current um, tax levy rate, but they currently add a bond ask to their community. So I'm not quite sure, but I think we would be right in the neighborhood with what college's uh, current tax levy rate would be. We're certainly below Linmar and Lisbon and Marion and Mount Vernon. And so just concept wise, it gets you an idea of where we compare with other districts within our uh, geographical location in Iowa. So big idea, here it is. Our kids deserve the absolute best. They have amazing staff members. You are amazing community members and families supporting our kids each and every day. Uh, we know that uh, the thing that impacts kids the most every single day is the staff in front of them. So this plan not only supports our kids, it supports our staff members too. And when we talk about equity and access across our system, this really is a plan that could sustain us for decades uh, with more predictable um, boundaries, with um, buildings that will be sustained and um, renovated and also um, in the best top shape as possible. Our facilities team does an amazing job of keeping our facilities upgraded, but 100 plus year old buildings are challenging to take care of, as are the buildings that were built in the baby boom era where they had to pop up schools everywhere every year because of the increased enrollment during that time. And so um, we're looking for quality spaces and places to support our kids for a really long time. Your engagement and our community's engagement is so critical. We really want your honest uh, feedback. And we also wanna pay attention to not just our district, but our community at large. And what are we doing to pay attention to our workforce needs and uh, giving um, our kids as much access to uh, things within their school day that can best prepare them. And then how can we help our community get access to our facilities as well for, from an economic uh, development point of view in order for everybody to be future ready. So that's the big idea. I get a little jacked up about it. I'm pretty excited to think about these possibilities um, and am so proud to serve our district and am really grateful for your attendance. This alone just shows how amazing our district is of your attendance and willingness to um, give us your input. So if you go to the last slide, John, I'll take a look at the chat here. And Heather, if you wanna put up the survey um, again in the chat, that would be great. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question about taking resources out of the Southeast side. We would be adding resources to the Southeast side. Um, one, to increase enrollment, as well as to increase um, um, upgraded facilities. Um, and so, Sophia, if you wouldn't mind, um, oh, the closure of McKinley. Again, we would keep McKinley in our, in our population. It would be still our building and it would be repurposed as a future, uh, potentially a high school for this innovative uh, magnet school program um, or perhaps another need, but uh, we would not, be giving up McKinley. It, it would still be our, ours. It just would not be a middle school um, in this plan. I see. 
Yeah, I agree. That's why we wanna make sure that McKinley stays in our inventory. Lots of possibilities. So if you think about a community school and a project-based school, things that we could do at a school like that. Um, what's challenging right now is McKinley can't fit 600 kids. It'd be very challenging to renovate it to fit 600 kids. Um, but what it does have is all these beautiful um, architectural components, history connected to Grant Wood. So we think about the innovative programs and magnet school program, that's a community school program. So right there in the med core, think about um, work organizations that could come in and do partnerships with our students on projects. We could have simulator labs. We could even have um, a, like a, a wing that's almost like an art curated learning space that slash museum um, that kids are learning, um, not just being creators of art, but also appreciators of art. And there's all, we are, we have an art collection as a district, if you didn't know. Um, we do have some Grant Wood paintings and other things that we own in that collection, but the idea would be to keep it in our inventory, maximize its opportunity that's right there and centrally located. So agree with you 100% there. All right. Thank you, Heather. Thank you for putting the survey form in there. Are there other questions um, that uh, you have? Please do include in the chat. Noreen, I can go back to the energy efficiency. Oh, um, that would be great. Thanks, John. Yep. So, uh, mention of HVAC upgrades bring question the overall energy efficient and reduction of fossil fuel use preferably to zero. So energy efficiency is something that we take into account on any construction project we do from roofing and our values of that roof to what type of HVAC equipment are we putting in and that being energy efficiency um, or energy efficient. So obviously right now, any of our new buildings um, and any of our HVAC upgrades um, in the recent history um, are geothermal and we know the benefits of that. Um, as far as trying to get to net zero, that is super, super expensive. And I don't know if Joe and Vicki are still on, if you guys have um, any cost numbers to get to net zero, but energy efficiency is, has been and always will be very important to this district. Um, and it's like something that we do in, in, every, in every project that we take into consideration. Uh, so we don't have any numbers that we can um, give you to do a net zero building. It's so dependent on what type of building it is, um, how big it is, and whether it's new or existing. Um, and so it'd be hard to kind of quantify those um, without knowing the specific building that we're trying to get to. But like John said, uh, one of the things about net zero is it's a fairly costly proposition. So what we have done, uh, like John said, in the last couple of buildings is tried to reduce the amount of power that we're consuming by using geothermal, by using um, state-of-the-art lights, uh, by really dialing in the amount of sunlight and using um, systems that allow the lights to be on and off depending on what those sensors are seeing. Uh, and then we just continue to try and improve both the envelope and how tight it is and uh, increase the amount of R value in the, in the envelope system to contain as much of that energy as we possibly can. Uh, to get to a net zero building generally means you have to do some form of on-site power generation. And unfortunately, um, it's very difficult as a public uh, enterprise to implement like solar because the tax credits that are accompanying solar projects go to private entities. And so you have to try and find a private entity that will team with you. And that's just been very challenging, but it's something we always are looking to do and consider. And um, actually we talk about it on every project, so. Thanks for that. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, John. Um, there is a uh, there was a recent board meeting um, that uh, uh, was around sustainability, and we actually have on our website um, a sustain sustain our sustainability plan. And this is always the goal is to be as efficient as we can with geothermal, etc. So, um, thank you for that question, and thank you for the responses. Um, Sophia I, or Angie, okay, here we go. I'm looking at both of these. Um, yes. Um, I think that's a good opportunity to, this, these are the exact kind of questions we want to make sure are being asked. And I think this is the kind of feedback the board certainly wants to hear. And 
will be a part of a deeper discussion there at the open um, at their uh, work session in October. But being more pronounced, you bet, about the McKinley, the plan for McKinley, I think is necessary as well, that we intend to keep it within our, our inventory and um, ideas for that for the future. Um, we are finding with innovative projects um, that there's a lot more opportunity for um, grant funding. Uh, we just don't know what the possibilities might be unless we kind of the green light for this. But just recently, um, for the high school magnet program, um, we have received um, uh, 200, three, over $300,000 in grants. But we've also submitted to the National Magnet Schools of America, the National Magnet School of America grant opportunity, which is a very big number. Um, our hope is that we get that, that grant and there would be not just this way to fund it, but also if we were looking at, um, if we look at the big picture of those buckets, if we know that the future of our secondary plans are being funded through one area, and that would be a geo bond funding, then that frees up some of the monies in the other buckets that are currently sustaining our facilities. So we can repurpose dollars in order to accomplish what might be future considerations and future goals. So that is an excellent question, but I think you're right. That deserves a deeper conversation um, and that uh, we would definitely wanna bring forth to the board, but we will try and do a better job of pronouncing that we would like to keep McKinley in our inventory. And that yes, it, we do know that it impacts busing for students, but I, it's like it, it, McKinley's going back to its original state. It was originally a high school. And so as the decades go, and as we reassess the needs of our community, um, we want to make sure that we're considering all those possibilities. So thank you for those questions. Um, thing in that, I think that's the same question there from Angie as well. Um, Butch, uh, thanks for your question about taxes. We, we do have, we've got to address the needs in our secondary buildings. We have to, it's more expensive for us to keep six middle schools open right now um, and, and based on enrollment than it would be for this future concept of uh, not just building reduction, but also how we utilize our staff members. Um, so that is uh, critical that we continue to assess the needs of our district, but also we are going. We need to. Um, we're going to, have to reconsider something for our middle schools um, to even out that enrollment trend for staff distribution for equity for students. But secondly, we know that we also need to address these facility needs. So if we don't get this ask for this particular plan we are going to have to have asks to upgrade our facilities and to improve them no matter what. And so it'll be multiple little asks along the way, which will be more expensive for us over the years. And we won't get to the destination of this particular plan probably for decades because we will only be able to do little asks along the way. So I know it's a big ask and you're absolutely right on that. But the return on investment is this will be um, a long sustaining plan that will help us for uh, hopefully 50 to 60 years. I'm a graduate of Jefferson High School. I can't believe that, you know, I'm going on my 35th year of, you know, my high school reunion. And that 35 years went pretty fast. And so, but I can't say that Jefferson's changed a whole lot other than adding a new gym um, from when I graduated there. And so the idea would be that we've got um, a sustainable plan that's long-term serving and we don't have to keep having multiple asks for our community that will undoubtedly be more expensive just from um, you know, uh, living expenses and cost construction expenses alone, but also it will not be, we won't be able to do a big comprehensive plan. It will have to chip away at it, which means that I would assume We'll have to keep assessing boundaries. We'll have to, every 10 years or so, we might have boundary shifts, which really impacts our families, which also impacts the selection that when people come to our town, they are selecting other districts. And much of the reason why 
is because we it, it is clear that we have to keep shifting our boundaries because we can't keep having an uneven enrollment around our district. But also when I got some feedback uh, through a real estate agency and also with some of the data uh, that we were able to collect um, throughout this process, uh, folks are choosing other districts because of the access to modernized facilities as well. And so we would like to not only keep our Cedar Rapids families, thank you for choosing Cedar Rapids, but we would, we would like them to continue to, to choose us and more and then some, uh, which then hopefully helps reduce those tax rate costs as well. So very real, you are very clear um, and right that this is a big ask, um, but we hope that it um, makes more sense to have an ask like this now than multiple asks that would be coming down the road that would be more expensive. Thank you for that. You're, thank you, Angie, you're very kind. Very kind. Other questions? We are developing an FAQ that is on our facility master plan webpage um, that your, your questions, um, any of these that have been asked tonight, it's so critical that we're getting these common themes of what um, our uh, community, our parents, our taxpayers, really want answers to. And we just want to do the very best we can um, for our kids. That's ultimately what all of this is about, is them and serving them as best as we can for their future. Also serving our community is the best way that we can for our future. And so we are trying to think we and not just what we need as a district, but what we really need as a community. So it is an it is an investment and we recognize that um, and we greatly appreciate uh, the consideration. Um, hopefully tonight has provided some context and some explanation, uh, but your feedback again has is, is been so critical. So the link of the QR code or using the link that Heather's used in the chat um, provides you an opportunity to provide more narrative feedback. And Heather will also record um, these uh, the questions that came, of course, with this uh, virtual session. So all this goes into the data we will be providing to the board. And also, uh, we just welcome you tap your neighbors on the shoulder. And if they weren't able to attend, this information will be available to them on our website. Uh, and so Don's question is what what message we would like the community members to hear at this point in the process. Um, is that these are concepts, we are getting feedback and we'll be um, taking that to the board so that they can have the best information possible as we move forward. But ultimately, this is a big picture, long-term plan to address the long-term needs for our kids and our community and our kids absolutely deserve it. Thank you for that elevator question, um, Dawn. We talk about an elevator speech. Thank you so much for that. Very good. Well, without seeing any more questions in the chat, um, my deepest gratitude to all of you for attending tonight. Um, thank you, co-hosts, Heather, Carla, John, and Joe for jumping in, um, and to uh, all of the attendees. Uh, your time is valuable, and you gave an hour and a half of it to, to us tonight, and uh, we know how hard your days are and how hard you work, and so we just greatly appreciate that. And thanks to our board members, um, for uh, genuinely wanting um, as much feedback as possible to make these, these decisions as we move forward. So um, thanks to everybody. Have a great night. We can end.